but first I'll go to somebody that we have just met actually, who's pretty new to Johnson & Wales. Jason Evans is the Dean of the College of Food Innovation and Technology at Johnson & Wales University. And he's gonna to talk to us a little bit about uh, their campus and they've got a LEED certified building that I haven't seen yet. And I'll be seeing when I go back in a couple of weeks, but heard ma major things about it. I know they have one of the better archives, uh, history archives and culinary in the country. Um, and then we've got uh, Ben uh, Suckley. Ben is the, um, he is- Too cold, just so we know. So, sorry, sorry. That's okay. That's sorry. okay. So Ben, <laughs> Ben is the uh, chef owner of uh, Uberlin in Providence, uh, but he also has been in the city for 17 years, a graduate of Johnson & Wales as well. But he'll talk about his other experiences at many of the fine dining restaurants there and where he is today and what's happening in that city. Of course, we're going to be there in June with the ICCA for our summit. Uh, Mariana uh, Gonzalez, um, and. Trasvino, right? Is yeah, that right? Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. She is the executive chef at uh, Bar Bartino in uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And their group has a lot of restaurants throughout um, Rhode Island and a little bit more, you know, outside of the state as well. But most of them are in there. And she'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, Jeremy Sewell, some of you know, because we worked with him before at an immersion we did in Boston a few years ago. So, Jeremy, glad to have you back on. Jeremy is row 34 and uh, he's been tied to Island Creek Oyster Bar. And I'll never forget last time you took us down to the, uh, you know, to where they, uh, the, the oysters are, are, uh, are raised and, uh, and harvested. And that was a really great experience. So maybe we'll get to do that again when we come up uh, for our culinary road trip in June. So Jeremy will talk to us too. So basically we've got, you know, Jeremy from Boston, you know, Ben from uh, Providence and Mariana from uh, Newport. So we're kind of covering that, you know, most of the uh, the coast of, of what's going on, you know, within New England and, and the food that's there. So we're going to talk about trends, what's happening. They've gone through a pretty tough time. Of course, we all know everybody has for the past year, but especially that region has been very difficult. A lot of it had to do with the winter weather, you know, as well as many other things that have happened. So um, I think they're all excited about the weather changing now and things getting up and, and running and uh, looking forward to us coming there in June. So we're looking forward to it as well. The hotel, just so you guys know, the ICCA that we chose, uh, the Graduate Hotel is amazing. And all of you probably have seen it before, too, that are speaking here today. But it's just they remodeled it in 2019 and pretty much it was closed for almost a year. So nobody was in there. Uh, so it's like brand, brand new. I mean, the carpeting, everything about it, the, the, it's outstanding. The great thing about it, too, is they were able to keep their entire staff. So I admire companies that were able to do that. So they're, you know, their executive chef. Uh, their banquet chefs and pretty much all their key employees uh, are back and with them now, which is really, really cool. So to get started, we'll start with Jason because he's got to peel off here uh, pretty soon. But again, um, Jason, let's talk a little bit about the campus and, you know, some of the facilities you have and uh, what we'll be able to see. And then you know, take us through a little bit of what's happening right now within your industry, because I know that the uh, you know culinary programs have also been affected quite a bit in the past year. So Jason, sure. you're on. Well, nice to virtually meet everyone, and I'm sorry that I have to peel off uh, at the beginning of the meeting here, but um, I've actually been in Providence at Johnson & Wales for about 13 or 14 weeks now. Um, I came on board in early January, um, and this is really my coming on board is all part of what was historically the College of Culinary Arts, uh, sort of transforming into the College of Food Innovation and Technology. And the reason that the university went in that direction, of course, um, is not only you know, a reflection of enrollment trends happening around the country and more traditional culinary and baking and pastry programs, but more than that, reflective of just this world of careers uh, in the food world right now. And, and frankly, in the next 10 years, careers that we, we can't even possibly anticipate right now. So um, within our umbrella, uh, we have not only our traditional um, culinary arts and baking and pastry two-year and four-year degrees, but also bachelor's degrees in sustainable food systems, culinary nutrition, culinary science, and food and beverage entrepreneurship. So really, uh, you know, what Johnson & Wales is trying to say to the world is we are now much more broadly to everything food, what we have always been to the culinary arts and baking and pastry arts. So um that's what we're taking to market is that if you want to understand food and, and have a career focused on food and food systems then we're your place um we we of course want all of our students no matter their major 
uh, to understand all of the implications of food, how it connects to every part of our lives, um, economy, political, sociological, historical, really every part of our lives. And so that's really coursing through all of our programs so that our graduates are very nimble um, and, and really can fit anywhere in the food system. So um, the building that I'm sitting in is the Cuisinart Center for Culinary Excellence. Uh, the building is, is um, you, don't make fun of me for not knowing the exact year. Remember, I'm new. <laughs> this building is 10 to 12 years old, 10 to 15 years old, maybe. Um, it's, I mean, it's incredible. Uh, the building, of course, on all floors is uh, full of state-of-the-art, some fairly specialized uh, bake shops and culinary arts laboratories. We also have a number of dining facilities in this building for our students to run all of their pop-ups and grand openings. So at the junior and senior level in our culinary program in particular, uh, those students really get to bring creativity to bear and design their own menus, launch their own restaurants. Um, and that's, of course, why when you come to Providence and see the number of restaurants that we have in the city, so many of them are owned and operated by Jewu alum. And, and I know that we have some of those on the call uh, even today. But it really is incredible what the Johnson & Wales assets and Johnson & Wales programs have done to the food scene in Providence over the last few decades. It's, it's palpable and, and, and pretty neat. So um, because we're expanding the ways that we're exposing our students to food, um, in coming months, we'll actually have some hydroponics installations in our building so that we're producing a little bit of what we're actually using in the kitchens and so that our students have some direct connectivity with the agricultural production side of the food system. We have uh, forthcoming partnerships with University of Rhode Island so that we can deepen that experience for our students even further into the ag pieces of the system. So right now on this campus, we're on the Harbor Side campus of Johnson & Wales. Um, there's the Down City campus, which is the main campus. We're only about three or four miles apart. Uh, but on the Harbor Side campus, uh, we have our Cuisinart Center building that I'm in. We have another academic building uh, full of labs and a demo kitchen with an amphitheater. Uh, but we also have a really uh, fairly new, modern, all-inclusive living uh, community here on this campus as well, really apartment-style living. And the great thing about all of these spaces is that they're right on the bay. So from my office, I see the ocean. And from these uh, students' dorms on this campus, they see the ocean. It, there really are lots of worse places we could be. So um, I'm, I'm so pleased to be at Johnson & Wales. Uh, my background is actually in agricultural economics. Um, and so I, I suppose that you know, I'm really here to make sure that our launch from traditional culinary arts programming to much more broad food programming uh, happens and, and happens in the right way. So, um, Kevin, I, I don't yeah, know if that's that great. introduction covered what that's you perfect. needed. But, um, that's uh, perfect, we, except for the fact that I, I, I will say this. I mean, I could see in, in Mariana's eye and probably in Ben as well. They're like, hey, where was that oceanfront place when I was going to school there? Right. <laughs> well, so apparently the building that I'm sitting in used to be a parking lot. So um, uh, I right, but I, so I don't know. I really don't know where the other, where the uh, previous building was was sited. But the 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 beauty of having these great dining rooms in this space that all frankly look out to the ocean is the food that's served in them. So I guess because I'm the boss, I get invited to all of these student pop ups <laughs> and grand openings and soft openings. So every night of the week, if I wanted to, I could eat here a really super good fine dining. And it's it's just incredible food. Um, it's the creativity that these guys are bringing to bear in putting these menus together and the technical skills they have in making it happen. I've been supremely impressed. Baking and pastry, the same thing. I mean, I, I actually think that Johnson Wales probably is the tip top for especially the breads and the chocolates and the sugar work. Um, I just don't know that there are programs that are doing what our students are doing uh, during their time here. Um, right. So I'm just hey, I've got a, yeah. I've Go got ahead. a quick question for you. So, you know, I mean, obviously we're in a real changing environment right now. Uh, from a, you know, curriculum standpoint, do you see or have you, uh, do you see you, you're, you know, changing to 
add in ghost kitchens or more on the delivery side or, or, or you know, or third party delivery? Is that going to be part of the curriculum or is it now? So it is now only to the extent that no matter what's happening in those labs, uh, especially at the upper level, the junior and senior level, there's rich conversation happening around what's really happening in the marketplace. We're also relying on our, uh, our alum network and extracurricular events that we're putting on, in fact, more frequently now than ever, where chefs and other food professionals are talking directly to our students about what's really happening in the marketplace, especially in light uh, of the pandemic and how the industry has changed and will continue to change. So yeah, any way we can, uh, we're exposing students to really boots on the ground what's happening in the market. Now, once the campus is, is expected to open fully back up in the fall for in-person learning, I mean, our labs never stopped being in person. So throughout the pandemic, we were operating almost uh, at normal. Uh, but in the fall, the entire campus will be up and running and open again. And so there are some things that we haven't done before that I anticipate incorporating through clubs and classes like food truck, like farmer's market on campus, um, like just these experiences that really are speaking to what's happening in the local food scene. Um, that they might not be getting in their traditional classes. Very cool. Well, thanks. Yeah. Thanks so much. Really appreciate you being with us today. I look forward to uh, seeing you in person and the campus sure. when we get there in June. No, we're really excited to have you guys on campus. I, I really, I think you'll be, I'm impressed. So I, 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 I think that you guys will be too. I hope so. Thanks so much. Really appreciate it. Sure. So we're going to go kind of in order. I mentioned earlier that, you know, uh, everybody on here knows uh, how we do things in democratic processes, either like putting names in a hat or whatever it might be. But we're going geographic today. So we're going to start with Jeremy Sewell from Boston, and uh, then we'll go to Ben and then Mariana uh, north to south. So, Jeremy, let's talk a little bit about you and the scene in Boston. And, you know, let's talk a little bit about what <laughs> the pain you've had to deal with here in the last year. And uh, coming out of it, most importantly, you know, where you are now and you see coming out of it in the next coming months. That's a lot. You might need a, a longer, <laughs> longer webinar, but I'll, I'll try to keep it short. You know, it's been, I, I, I don't think my experiences are unique. Uh, I think it's, you know, been an industry-wide struggle. I think we've all had to manage it and handle it uh, in our own way. And I think, you know, region to region where you I mentioned Florida has been a little more open. I think, you know, Massachusetts uh, has been pretty strict on the regulations, you know, with indoor, outdoor dining. Um, I also have a restaurant in New Hampshire. That's been a little more, uh, you know, a little more progressive in their kind of approach to it, if, if that's the word you want to use. But, um, you know, I think the biggest issue that we've had in New England is it just you didn't have the diners, regardless of the restrictions, regardless of, uh, you know, what the, your capacity was, what your bar seating was, what anything like that. There just weren't the groups of diners to fill the restaurants for whatever reason. I just think that, you know, you know, the winter was a big thing. There was no outdoor option. People were really choosing not to go out. Uh, so the restaurants were really, I think, struggling. I think this last year, the summer was a nice little boost for everyone um, that in the, the state of Mass and New Hampshire have been great about different communities have let us do big outside patios have blocked off side streets for us and things like that. So I think the, the, the different municipalities have been really wonderful about trying to help us figure out some great, you know, creative, interesting options to help us survive. But at the end of the day, I, I think our biggest challenge was we just didn't have the diners to fill those seats, you know, on a, on a broad, on a broad stroke. Um, you know, weekends were good. Boston itself, specifically Boston, you don't have and haven't had the, the tourism that you kind of come to depend on is a, a citywide. Um, and it's not just tourists that fill the restaurants. It's, you know, people coming to visit that visit family and they're looking for an opportunity to go out and, and that fills restaurants or college visits. There's a ton of universities and colleges in the Boston area. Um, you know, all of those things kind of, you know, trickled into just a really challenging year. Now, I think we're really at a great point um, to figure it out. We did, you know, we obviously pivoted to, to go uh, only at all of the restaurants and it did well. You know, <laughs> my, my restaurant in Boston is on Congress Street in the seaport and it's like a highway. It's just there is people, cars everywhere. 
and my the biggest everyone's like, what was the biggest surprise about COVID is I I could still walk across Congress Street while looking at my phone and not pick up my head and there's you know there's <laughs> nobody on the street. You know we're right near the financial district and, and yeah. you know Boston was a bit of a ghost town. So you know and it it still is and I think that is going to be the challenge going forward is some of these restaurants and in areas and that depend on different communities that have a high concentration of offices and people filling those offices. And, and those are your diners, right. those are your crowd. Right. So I so think I that you, is, you mentioned the college and university already. And I know how big that is because running events in Boston, as I have over the years, you had to stay away from graduations and all that thing. Cause it's such a big part of your huge. Business. Yeah. So I mean, that's a, that's a big part of our businesses this time of year, you know, yeah. really dependent upon, and the colleges are great, you know, you know, Harvard, BC, BU, MIT, they would all, you know, try to not overlap. So you would just have weeks of just, you know, really, really strong business. And that's, that's been gone this year and last year. So you've really lost out on two seasons. Um, we did it just as a, you know, an overall kind of looking at it, we did much better in the suburbs. I have a restaurant in Burlington, Mass, which is, you know, about 20, 30 minutes outside of Boston. We did great there. I think that, you know, people, we're home. It's still more of a community where people live rather than Boston, where it's a commuting, you know, people commute into work. Great uh, reception from the, the communities coming in to support the restaurant um, in New Hampshire as well. And so I thought some of our suburban location, you know, and mine and some others did really well. My friends who have small restaurants that aren't in the city did great, you know, and we did great in, in Burlington. Um so that was really interesting to see those those urban kind of locations, I think, struggled the most for us anyway, and, and some of my colleagues in the town that I've talked to. But, you know, I think for us as a whole, you know, the pivot to the to go was great trying to get open last year. And I think all of us, if anyone opened last year in indoor dining or outdoor dining, we were just waiting to get shut down again. There was just this kind of heaviness for all of us to say. You just were waiting for the governor to come on and say, well, we're going to shut down indoor dining in the fall, which they did. Uh, then you try to extend, you know, I don't care how great your heat lamps are. No one wants to sit outside New England in the middle of winter and, and you know, spend 30 bucks on an entree. So it was a little bit propped up in, in a way that just didn't feel like it was sustainable at all. So, um, you know, hopefully we're on the other side of that. I, I, I think it's been great to kind of get open, get the doors open. You know, it's spring, patios going, all of those things. And as, it, as a whole, I think that the dining community has been exceptionally supportive in, in New England. You're, you're muted there, Kevin. I'm muted. Um, so, so from a dining stand or a menu standpoint, you know, it's almost like you're back at the beginning. And so are you putting on your like biggest hits that you've had on the menu to start with that first and then expanding, or are you going to be creative when you, you know, when people start coming back more in a, in mass? Yeah, that's a great question. I, I you know, I think <laughs> the first few days were open. I think I could have served peanut butter and jelly. People were just so excited to show up and go out and, you know, and be in the restaurant and get a glass of wine and, a, you know, and a beer and sit down. Uh, it wouldn't have mattered. I, you know, for us, I think it's, you know, it's, you're really reopening. You're starting from scratch again. We've been very fortunate to retain a lot of our staff. Um, but, you know, oper you know, you're still at 50% capacity here in Boston. So, you know, being very careful on the, on the dollars you spend with, with food and staff. And again, we, we really want to reestablish ourselves playing a lot of our favorites, you know, this is the one year in the spring and, and, you know, you don't read at the end of the year, the new year, what are the food trends for 2021? You know, what's the hot ingredient? Like all that stuff has kind of been put to the side. Uh, and people are just like, let's get open as a, as an industry. Let's, you know, let's move this forward. So for us, it's been about, you know, taking care of our guests the best we can reopening these restaurants. And, and from a culinary standpoint, it's do what we know we can do really well don't you know we're, we're not in a position where we're trying to innovate or do something really interesting or new we you know it, it's a little bit of playing the hits and, and doing the best we can uh and surviving you know through this time and so from a, a product standpoint it's not been an issue i mean I, you know to get what you need and want or has it been a little bit yeah it's a challenge i, I think the supply chains are, are are different now i think we're all figuring that out um you know, the price of meat is through the roof. I always used to say I, I was an idiot to open a seafood restaurant. I would, you know, the price of burger has been, you know, the price of beef and, and it has been crazy. So I, 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 
we're all we're all in trouble. Um, you know, I, I we've we've still try to work with our network of local fishermen and farmers, but I, I think that everyone is just under a kind of different pressures to figure out. You know, the oysters, all my oyster farmers, I, not all, a lot of them I deal with are trying to sell off the end of last year's crop. They have all these really big oysters are trying to find yeah. homes for. Where, you know, you try to support them, but it's definitely you know this isn't well you know everyone's vaccinated the restaurants are re- reopen and it's business as usual i think this is an industry that's going to struggle from a supply standpoint food sourcing staffing for for a long time to come i, I think there is a hangover that from an industry wide standpoint that we're all going to have to to kind of get through beyond just the point of surviving the last you know 12 14 months of you know these uncharted waters but now it's okay, what's next? How does the industry kind of redefine itself going forward? And I know you're so close to the seafood industry that, you know, and also just fishermen in general. Um, but what did they do? Did they just like, you know, come back a little less on their harvests because they wanted to manage the demand or, you know, were they so, freezing product or what were they? Doing? Yeah. So there, it was, I mean, there was a huge shift to retail. So a lot of, you know, Aquaculture, whether it's fin fish or shellfish, was trying to move to retail. Uh, a lot of them tried to do prepared foods. Freezing became a huge thing. Um, you know, frozen portioned wild, you know, New England seafood became a, a real kind of moment for people to, one, you could go fishing and sell your fish. There was, and a lot of guys just tied their boats up and didn't, didn't do a lot. Um, they just stayed at the dock and it was, you know, if they got a little bit of government assistance or you know, unemployment, it was just a better option than trying to go out there, catch fish and trying to not knowing where they were going to sell it uh, when they got back to the dock. So uh, it some, you know, for whatever reason, the lobster market thrived. It didn't seem anyone was, you know, lobsters were crazy price. And I think a few less fishermen than there were last year. And, you know, for the most part, the fin fish guys that pivoted to help, you know, to understand that there was a retail need and work with those people for reach it, you know, direct to a consumer or, um, you know, grocery store packaging, those guys did pretty well, but it's, it's, again, I still think it's trying to figure itself out. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks so much. I mean, I really appreciate it. Stay with us too, because we're going to go to sure. Ben and then Mariana, and then we'll come back around for all of us to talk together. But uh, Ben, let's go over to you now, because I know it's uh, been an interesting time for you as well. And um, you opened your first restaurant on your own, you know, in 2012, right? And I know it's one that was a casualty during this past year. And so sorry to hear that and it's you know, was your love but you know got you to where you are today so why don't we talk a little bit about that and I think you mentioned to me as well as I, you know I think you gave me a really good information about what's happened in general in Providence on how when it changed around 2008-ish or something like that and it really started to really expand as far as the type of offerings and type of restaurants that you see there. Yeah I mean it's like I guess like to go back, like I opened Birch in 2012 and Birch started out as a, it was a fine dining place. So it was like four courses, set menu, um, come in, but it was in the sense it was all very stripped down. So there was no tablecloth. There was no, you know, intense, uh, server service and all of that. And so that one lasted for about eight years and about, uh, yeah, about eight years. So about halfway through, I opened Oberlin, which was essentially the same product, just like we added pasta and we added um, just like a, it's, it's, you know, we added like a crudo menu to go with it, where it's all stuff that's mainly Rhode Island, some Massachusetts seafood. Um, and so we've got a very tight knit community when it comes to product um, and where we get it from and the, you know, every year we try to make that distance get lower, closer and closer, closer to home. Um, but yeah, so that was, you know, both my restaurants are about two blocks away from each other. Um, and, you know, I think any restaurant that was doing a tasting menu or a fine dining restaurant, you know, you can't really put that into takeout. It doesn't really translate well to something like that. So, you know, we, we, we switched over to a concept of essentially like, you know, clam shack favorites, where it was like, you know, we had lobster rolls and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that kitchen's meant for much smaller production, not, you know, I mean, it got insane to us where we were going through, you know, it's like 600 pounds of potatoes in a couple of days. It was just like, this is not the, the, the square footage of that restaurant was altogether 600 square feet. So like to do that kind of stuff was 
quite a transition. And like the guys that were working there were just, they were working their ass off and they were just getting tired. And then the combination, like my restaurants being only about two blocks away from each other was a sense of like, you know, one was casual, one turned into casual. And so it just became this motion of this, like almost cannibalizing in a sense with having them just so close together that it just got to a point where it was this, you know, there needs to be a call made here. And then like, I'm, you know, I'm going nuts going back and forth between the two places. And so that was the call and that was unfortunate. And, you know, it feels like, you know, it, it felt like it was that restaurant Birch was on its way to getting to the point where I was ready to let it go. And then it kind of happened before then. So it's like, you're never really you're always kind of bitter about that kind of thing when you don't get to call the shot when it comes to something like that. Um, but that's just how it goes. Um, and then, you know, we are the restaurant we are now with Oberlin. Um, I think compared to the other two who are here with us, you know, we have, it's a very small, very just like, you know, employee driven restaurant in the sense that, you know, we're, we're still not doing indoor dining. Um, and that's a, based on a completely democratic process where, you know, none of the staff felt comfortable until they were vaccinated families are vaccinated and that's you know we we shut down a week before government mandates happened um and it just because we just saw the writing on the wall with that one and we you know it's been that same way ever since so it's always been like a you know are we ready for this and so we started doing street dining and the city's been great when it comes to you know allowing permits um allowing people to you know you know, do dining rooms in the street. Like today I had a license meeting with the board of licenses. It took 15 minutes. I've never <laughs> seen that sort of efficiency happen before. And it was fantastic. Um, but you know, that's, it, it's kind of like this been this whole slog through it. So you're not really sure, you know, what's coming out on the other end because you're only able to focus on what's happening right in front of you day to day and just kind of waiting on the news and waiting to see like, when you, everyone's feeling comfortable to do it. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And so it, it, like now I know you, your, your city did a lot of things. What is it called? Fire on the water or something like that. The water fire. Water yeah. Fire. They've been doing that for a lot of years. Yeah. Yeah. So is that something scheduled to come back or is that, you know, so are I events no, going to start don't happening? Have any intentions. I mean, that's a pretty big gathering of people that happens with that. So I don't think they're quite rushing to do that they're more apt to allowing streets to be shut down. And which is, a, you know, I can't imagine what kind of nightmare that is with the Department of Public Works or just letting people, you know, firefighters know that you can't go down that street because you'll just run over 30 seats or whatever. Um, but they've been more apt to focus on allowing individual restaurants to essentially ask for the moon and you get pretty close to it. When you when you're asking for those things so it's like you know the street out front of oberlin is now closed you know from 12 o'clock from noon on whenever i wanted to wow that's cool yeah, yeah. so that, like, that's like that's like, like a nice progress because that gets us to this that gets us bigger with the sidewalk dining and uh, dining room stat like in the street parking that gets us to a bigger dining room than we've had with so does that make it block by block so uh, one block could be closed the next block mm -hmm. is still open okay yeah but uh, I guess they, I did hear that uh, on Federal Hill, I guess they, um, they're doing weekends. They shut it all down, yeah. Yeah, For so what is it like Friday afternoon to Sunday, something like that? I think it was just, yeah, Friday evenings and Saturday, like during the day or something like that, yeah. yeah. I tried to stay away from that area during that time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty cool. They, they did that in our community in Florida as well, which, you know, yeah. they closed down the streets and it was very successful, you know, for people to be able to, especially when it was a really big push some months ago for uh, more in, more outdoor mm -hmm. dining, than indoor dining. But I'm hopeful too, and you know, Jeremy brought it up as well. You know, now that so many people are being vaccinated, I think that, you know, again, it's a lot of it's a confidence too from the general public about going out. And I think the more mm -hmm. people are, you know, vaccinated, the more they feel like other people are vaccinated, uh, that, that it'll relax a little bit. And we'll see more people coming around to, yeah. you know, to do certain things. So the, um, you know, in certain cities, there's been a lot of openings as well. Has there been any, any new restaurant openings in, you know, in, in Providence or has it been pretty? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's surprisingly a, a good amount of restaurants have opened in Providence. Um, I realize a lot of that's contractual, you know, you kind of already paid for the money. So these things kind of like push all the way through, which 
if I was opening up a restaurant during a pandemic, it would be nice to not to spend as much money on plates and glassware. And that would be a nice saved cost to be able to do something like that. Um, but yeah, there, I mean, there's a decent amount of restaurants that are opening and, you know, it, it's, it seems to be more niche and more like kind of like very specific foods that are opening up brick and mortar because Providence really takes to mobile eateries. So when it comes to like food trucks or just like pop-ups at farmer's markets or stuff like that, people are able to get a really good uh, crowdsourcing that way as far as like word of mouth. And so, you know, within a year you see brick and mortar places pop up for, you know, certain kinds of ice cream cones. And like, that's, that's great. Right. And that's like, you, you just like see that happen. They just like absolutely blow up or if it's donuts or something like that. So you see these, like, you know, a lot of people that are willing to support from their home, from, you know, just like with getting takeout. I mean, the, the turnout was pretty impressive. Like, you know, with Oberlin, we kind of pivoted to a sort of quasi bakery. And so restaurants started buying our breads as well as like, we just have you know, a very large list of like breads that we would mill the flour in house for. So like that turned into something that like people were always like wanting something new, which kind of made it challenging because you kind of felt like you had to keep producing something new and keep pushing out like different like specials or stuff like that. When, you know, now with when we have outdoor dining returning, it's nice to be able to like, you know, what Jeremy was saying is like, yeah, we can just like go back to our classics and like we can kind of like have these things that like people were wanting beforehand when we were having a dining room that we can just like, all right, we don't have to do a, a bakery theme today. We don't have to do this kind of theme today. We can actually just like focus on being what we were before, which is like, I'm starting to get that feeling more and more, which is a really positive and really lovely feeling to have where we can just like use our plates and not have to do like brunch boxes or pastry boxes, which is like, like, I, I don't like, I don't hate the fact that we had to do that. I mean, but it was like, I'm sure everyone knows what their dining rooms turned into and like they turned into to go container like factories essentially. And like everyone had to deal with that. And like, you know, hard path of my dining rooms filled with just like stuff that we don't have to go downstairs for now because it's a convenience factor. And so like <laughs> now like the idea of like moving them all back down, but like the fact that we're at that point is a very uplifting feeling. Yeah, that's great. It's funny. You made that one point. I was talking to Justin Warner is going to be on here. He's one of the food network guys and, just was on the uh, Tournament of Champions as the co-host there. He's going to be on in a couple of weeks. He opened a new restaurant during this time in all places of South Dakota. But <laughs> what he told me was, just to your point you just made, he said this really actually helped him a lot. He said that he ended up doing it without investors because he had the space already. And so what they did was just, you know, to go and third-party delivery. So he didn't have to buy the china. He didn't have to buy the, you know, the dining room tables and chairs. Hadn't done that yet. So he was able to open up make some profit that then he can invest little by little in the things he had to do. So they're not open yet for indoor, but he said it put them in such a better place to do the grand opening for indoor dining um, that sure. he's, he's yep. going to be able to do it now without investors, which is amazing. I mean, that's a nice one. That's a nice story to have. Yeah. That's a nice, yeah. nice position to be in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Rare, rare. I'm sure that the overhead in uh, South Dakota is not quite of Boston or Providence or Newport. Uh, <laughs> Hey, uh, you also mentioned too about street food, Asian street food, which you really didn't see a whole lot of in Providence. So what's so there's more of that type of influence coming into the city. I mean, right? it's not just Asian; it's just like all kinds. Um, you, you're able to see guys who start, you know, by making pizza, like they're doing, you know, Sicilian style, like the pan style pizzas in Rhode Island, and you're able to see. You know, if you have like, it's really easy to get a really good support network with the communities around here. Like we have, like very much different communities and if you're able to do well by them in my opinion they'll continue to support you constantly and you know for that to go for like you know it could be any kind of street food at that point it can be desserts it can be a bakery or anything like that you see like something like tried and true tested things instead of just flat out opening is like a reasonable recipe for success when it comes to that but it also Build it, taking the time to build a community in your community and build that trust, I think is important too. Yeah, very, very cool. Yeah. So, uh, well, good. Well, thanks. We'll hang in there for a minute because we're going to go to Mariana right now and then we'll come back to, together with uh, with all of you. And I've got some questions that people have asked. So, um, Mariana, uh, again, thanks for joining us. And, uh, you know, well, let's talk about Newport. I heard some really good things when I was in Providence a couple of weeks ago, um, talking to the hotels in particular. 
they were going how they struggled through last, you know, summer and fall. And they're talking about, you know, six to nine percent occupancy. Jeremy, you said that as well about the, the hotels in Boston were in that same vein. And they said they're talking to their counterparts in Newport and these guys are oversold. <laughs> like, what? How did that happen? So let's talk about a little bit first on the positive side about what you guys did to really be able to do so well in, in last summer and fall. Absolutely. Uh, thank you for having me. It's been really incredible to see how Newport has been such like a hub for, you know, that outdoor dining. It really hit us right away after the pandemic when we were able to reopen. And I think just, you know, naturally with the summer weather, people migrate towards the town. Um, people want to be in Newport in the summer. Um so I think that it just naturally happened that people got out of the cities and kind of um, looked for a place that was a little less populated. So I think that was a huge factor into why we were busy from right from the get go. You know, some of the biggest challenges were that we were working with skeleton crews uh, right away and we had a very busy summer. So um, I was able to really, you know, maintain my core group of cooks and staff and everyone worked really hard for each other and you know just trying to swim and keep the food quality the best that we could even with all the challenges that we were facing back then um but it's been incredible over the winter time it did slow down a little bit um but our takeout really really skyrocketed during that time um, so as our indoor dining kind of uh, diminished a little bit, our takeout became about 70 percent of our sales uh, from a week to week basis. We have a very good um, standing with the locals in Newport as well. So most of our clientele in the city actually live in Newport all year round. So they were a huge factor of why we were successful as well, because they continued to support us through the uh, through this time. So you said your uh, location, too, is a little closer to where people live, as opposed to uh, some of your other restaurants that are in your group that are more in the real tourist you know, part of the area. Yep. Um, we are actually right at the end of Broadway Street, which is where like the locals live and play and drink and eat. Uh, so people don't have to go far to reach us. And, you know, the I know the restaurants that we're more in the downtown area, um, like the Mooring, 22 Bowens, all both from the restaurant group. They struggled a little bit more than us just because of that factor. Um, we're also we're very lucky that. Um, our restaurant is the smallest one out of the group. So we were able to, you know, kind of maintain the same like staffing grid. And we were able to just keep up with how the levels changed being that, you know, um, the service and everything. Um, and as well as having, you know, not the demand that some of the restaurants had where, over the summertime, they were doing 400 covers a day. And then come wintertime, they were doing 40. We wow. stayed at, you know, at 100 between between 100 and 200 all year round. So we were pretty stable in that sense as well. That's great. And um, I know you said, you know, you're, you're born in uh, Mexico City. And then, you know, uh, so talk to a little bit about, you know, your influence and, you know, from your childhood and your, and, and the cooking of your family uh, to where that ends up on the menu today. Yeah. Um, so I am originally, like you said, from Mexico city, I did live in Puerto Rico for 10 years as well. I come from a big Latin family where, you know, during all the holidays, all the cousins and grandpas and grandma and all of them would get together and like really just share recipes and share those memories so that's why I fell in love with cooking because of that, how much that culturally attaches to my personal past as well. Um, but it was really cool that with Barcino, it's a Italian um, concept, but, you know, even it's, we call it the green and white of Italy versus the red. So it's a lot of like, you know, the fresher 
pastas, like not so heavy, um, like breaded things. It's more a lot of salads, like we have grilled pizzas. Um, but a lot of the same cultural backgrounds that I have found we have in Mexico are the same things that, you know, Italians like have as well. They come from like those big families that get together and just cook together um, through the holidays. Um, so it was really cool to kind of compare those and then seeing that same window, I guess, of, um, of relations that people have. The cool thing too, was that we were actually able to, to keep us moving in the winter time. We were able to open up a ghost kitchen, um, because I'm lucky enough to have a very big, uh, prep kitchen in my basement. So it was, big enough that we were able to actually put up um, taqueria styled menu from downstairs and do just do a takeout. So that kept us moving through the winter time as well. Um, it was a lot of very simple menu. There was only like six tacos in the menu. We had tamales, um, a couple of desserts, um, ceviche, but you know, things that we try to figure out things that would travel well and every single item was very representative of my culture and where I came from. Um, so it was really cool to be able to actually come up with a different concept that was closer to my cultural backgrounds during this time that um, rather than just doing what we have been doing for the past two years. I love what you named it and why. Why don't you talk us through that? Yeah, absolutely. It's called La Vecina, uh, which means the girl next door. Um, during the pandemic, the store next door to us, which was a clothing store, actually went under and the um, landlord was gracious enough to offer it to us at a very low rate just because it's right there in the building. So we actually were able to kind of obtain our full capacity, like originally, even with all the restrictions. Um, and we just thought that, you know, once we go back to normal, what life will be, there will be a lot of challenges actually being able to put out food for double our original capacity because the kitchen in Barcino is just not that big. Um, so we wanted to kind of come up with like something to actually do in that newer site. So we thought the girl next door was the perfect thing for it. So you'll continue on with that menu or it's similar something, some similar, you know, Latin influence menu and uh, out of yep. the kitchen in there. Yeah, we closed down uh, for the last few weeks um, just to kind of focus on, you know, the coming back of like the business. We just had restaurant week happened and this week is school vacation. So we've actually been really busy. And I mean, the sun's out. So as soon as the sun's out here in Newport, the town just gets packed. Um, so we've seen a very big increase in sales in the last two, three weeks. We decided to close down the takeout only part of the kitchen, which was La Vecina. Um, but we also decided to invest into making it a permanent home for it. Um, so we're in the process of building a bar in that side and reconfiguring the kitchen downstairs so that we are actually able to dedicate that space solely for the taqueria. That's awesome. Well, as I said to you on the uh, on our call yesterday, is I was in Newport a couple of weeks ago and I was quite surprised. It was a Tuesday afternoon. Uh, we were there for lunch and it was quite busy. And one thing that really I, I noticed is a big difference, of course, running an event there before and being there many times even since, um, is that I was surprised at how many people built major outdoor structures uh, for dining that are much more permanent. I mean, they're steel structures that are you yeah. know, pretty much plastic or glass enclosed, but you can see where people embrace this outdoor dining. And I think as the future goes on, it looks like something that's going to really be a, a big positive for, you know, diners in Newport. Definitely. I mean, the city of Newport was very great to us as well. Um, just like in Providence and they closed down streets. They took a lot of like public parking that was in place and turned it into the outdoor seating for the restaurants. Um, but, you know, people, it was incredible to see people were wanted to sit out there even into November. Um, and once November hit, we started seeing all these like actual structures, like you said, like these like really cool, like igloo looking domes um, and things like that, that I think that even once we're back to normal, um, there is definitely a push for the town to keep certain streets closed in certain areas just for that, because even with the restrictions 
uh, lowering now, it would be a great aid to all the restaurants to just have those extra seats outside. And I think for the summertime, people are still going to want to really look for that. And they, I mean, people absolutely love it. It's you get to sit outside in Newport, like, you know, see the ocean, feel the air. And I feel like that's what the town is about. Um, and I think that, you know, that's something that we will definitely see a lot more in the future. Awesome. And that's actually, I'm going to come back to you, Jeremy, because you had mentioned about a ghost kitchen as well. Why don't you bring up and talk a little bit about what you did with your version of the ghost kitchen, which I thought was ironic when we were talking to the two of you together. It's like, <laughs> yeah. very similar. Well, we, so when we kind of turned row 34 back on for takeout only last summer, we put a big sign up, we called it and we did a little bit of, we just did the basics. So you could get like lobster and fried clams. We called it the window and we set up a, a little bit of a booth on the patio. You could come up and place your order and get it. And uh, so we talked about my chef and my restaurant Burlington is from Mexico city. And, and he, we talked about doing something different. So we did a we did a tacos as well. We called it La Ventana, and uh, which was the window for uh, tacos in, in Burlington. And we did delivery only, and it it crushed. I mean, it did really it did great. It was just a you know a, a big part of it, kind of turning back on for it to go only last year before we went dine. You know, a little bit of indoor and outdoor dining was like. I think for all of us, you're just trying to cast the widest net you can, just try to get as many people engaged with 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 your restaurant, and we just. You know, Burlington is a big restaurant, big kitchen. Um, and it was really, I mean, from a morale standpoint, for those guys to kind of work on something different and fun. And, you know, the, the, we're all under these constraints of like, God, don't spend any money. You know, you're, you know, you're, you know, like, like Ben said, it's stacks of to-go containers in the dining room and just has a really awkward feel. So for us to be able to kind of turn on something fun and be a little bit creative and, and really let the team loose on that. It was great. And it, we're, we're keeping it. It's, it's done so well, you know, we're renovating that restaurant right now and it'll reopen in a couple of weeks and uh, you know, we're going to keep the, the, to go and take out uh, and we're adding takeout for that as well, but also delivery uh, for the La Ventana and it's, it's gone, it's gone great. That's great. And we've actually, you know, talked to so many operators across the country that have gotten into this and, you know, they feel the same way. It's something they're going to continue on with. And, you know, it sounds like both of you, you know, came on and something that was a hit and, you know, why let that go away? I mean, stick to it and, and see where this, uh, see where it, where it takes you. Um, I want, this is a question for uh, Ben and, and Jeremy from, you know, from the uh, audience, but uh, college is now, you know, reopening without them for the last year. I, of course, I would assume because of the difference in age versus maybe the people that regularly live in the cities, there's probably a big difference in preferences on food. So with the colleges reopening, I assume that's going to happen in the fall. Is that true? Probably not summer. But with that, I mean, is it going to be a big difference in what the demand for the types of food or is it pretty much the same? Are they looking for the same food that your regular customer that may be an older person that lives in the area? Are they I think the what same? Jeremy like touched on is just like you could like make a cheese sandwich. And I think there's like, there's like, I know there's a hangover, but there's also like a, a going to be a boom when it comes to just like coming back. And it like, if you're able to diversify, like how Mariana and Jeremy have done where they've, you know, they've got the taco stand and like just being able to diversify what they can do within a space. I think like it's, that's only going to help, but like coming back to it, I, I, I'm speaking for myself here. It's just, we've seen it just like, like, the few tables we have out are booked about a month already. And it's like, it's just like, it's, it's it like, we, we haven't said at nothing as far as like what we're doing. And like, as far as if we're going to have a different menu or if there's going to be a different style, it doesn't matter. Um, which is great. You know, it's like, it's nice to have that kind of support. And I think when the colleges are back in town, I mean, like right now, I'm sure both of you are the same way where we've like our graduation reservations are done. Like we're booked, like we have all of them, like we're ready to go. So it's like, it, it's, it feels like normal. It feels like it's never happened based on some of the questions we're getting from these reservations as if like nothing has happened in the last year, um, which can be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but, you know, they play a big role. And as far as what they offer, I think they're just looking for some sort of normalcy. And we provided that, what that feeling of comfort was before. And I think that's just like, we're just kind of hoping to just like, you know, slide right back into that. Yeah, I think for Boston, you know, the all the I mean, it's a pretty dense population of universities and colleges. And I think it creates its own little economy. I mean, if you go 
beyond the, you know, I, I don't, I'm not focused on feeding the students, even though I do some, but it's the, you know, the parents weekends, the college visits, the faculty, the staff, like it's this great little ecosystem that we have here of a, uh, you know, a population that really interacts with the restaurants on a variety of ways. So like when that is every element of that was off the table, you know, just really made it challenging. Like you get, you know, you know, these college visits throughout the year, the parents weekend, the homecoming, whatever it is that the college is doing that creates some excitement around it. You know, we, we, the, the Boston restaurant community feeds off that and, um, people are psyched to come back in, in all forms, but, uh, you know, that is not come back nor, well, I think it, it'll be a while before, you know, my, you know, my, thank God, my, um, I'm in between, I, my oldest is in college and my middle child is not quite ready to look at colleges, but like I have done so many phone conversations with, with, uh, parents who are, you know, where college that my son goes to in Pennsylvania or, uh, you know, uh, I went to the CIA and still work with the Culinary Institute of America on their advisory panel. Like I've done a ton of zooms with those people. It's unfortunate people can't physically go see these colleges and, and try to understand what, what it is. And that is a part of our ecosystem, you know, for diners here. And we we've lost out on that. Hopefully it'll come back stronger than it was. Yeah, I hope so as well. And, you know, I'm sure, I'm sure it will. I mean, I know a lot of people took a year off or whatever, you know, the kids did, you know, after graduating, but, I'm sure they're excited and, you know, really want to get, you know, into the school that they selected or they were accepted to and uh, get on with their lives as well. So, yeah, we're all hopeful that, um, you know, and, you know, a lot of people talk in the past too on the positive side of, are we back to the roaring twenties once this thing it really fully opens up? And there's a lot of optimism that people feel that way, that it's going to be, you know, just a boom. I think there's a, should be a lot of cautious, optimism like i just think that if the expectation for any operator that that's going to happen you're you're kidding yourself i i think uh you know as chefs we have had to really learn how to run our businesses better than ever because the economic challenges that we have faced you know in this have been unlike anything before and we've had to we you know our focus has not been on the maybe the creativity side but it's the you know the business side and that is that's not going to go away for a little bit and i think you know i think for us my hope is and i, I mean i'll speak for myself is i, I don't want to see it spike and just crazy open and go and then it fall off i'd love to see you know a, a nice nice consistent levels of business um in the industry for for a long time to come i'd rather see that than then, you know, everything catch on fire because, you know, we're still having staffing challenges like we did before. You know, there's just there's a lot of challenges in the industry that aren't going to go away tomorrow just because the world turned on. Yeah, no, that's that's a good point. Staffing challenges. That's one of the other interesting comments that Mariana, you made to me uh, the other day is, of course, with your background. And I guess, Jeremy, you have that with your chef in Burlington as well as you know, coming from Mexico City and communication wise, I'm sure that's a big benefit um, in recruiting, you know, cooks in the kitchen to be able to, you know, speak fluent with them and, you know, and, and have a certain, you know, um, a, a certain um, expertise, I guess, in, in that. And especially with your, you know, your new operation and Jeremy, the one that you're expanding into, that's probably because anything you can do to bring in you know, kitchen staff, we all know that our members, they're struggling big time. You know, the chain industry, of course, it is kind of funny, this $15 an hour thing that's come around. I mean, chains haven't been paying minimum wage forever. I mean, you just, you can't, you guys aren't either, I'm sure, because you can't get, you know, the talent you want by paying minimum wage. So uh, it's a challenge. And hopefully once all this, you know, stimulus money, you know, goes away, uh, people will be interested in coming back to work. A good way to put it, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we need staff for sure. <laughs> tougher and tougher as the summer comes towards us. Yeah, well, I'm going to make a couple closing comments. We're at the hour, like I said to you before, too, is the hour just flies by. But uh, before I do that, uh, let's go to some closing comments. Um, we'll, uh, you know, Jeremy, we'll go in the same order. Jeremy, what's some, you know, closing thoughts you want to give to our members as corporate chefs and chains and our sponsors who are some of the, you know, bigger um, industry players uh, within food service. Yeah, I, I, 
you know, I, I, I don't know. I think it, it's been a, it's been a real look in the mirror for everyone in this industry. I think that, you know, from, you know, from a staffing standpoint, you know, the, the couple of comments I have is one, you know, we, I think it's going to be on all of us to create environments that people are going to want to work in. Um, you know, I, I, I think structure, you know, there's, there's a whole element of, of, it doesn't matter how much you pay. If it's a horrible place to work, people aren't going to stay. So it's going to be a mixture in our industry. I think of, of a more livable wage, whatever that ends up looking like, or being a culture that kind of gives people an opportunity to grow and develop, you know, um, and all of, you know, in just a really good environment for these people to work in. And I think that, you know, that's something we talk about all the time. Uh, you know, I've been fortunate. I have a lot of long time, long-term employees and we've gone through a process of like kind of interviewing them and saying, you know, why, why have you stayed for so long? And a lot of them, they keep saying, well, it's like you're treated well and then you have an opportunity to grow and learn and, and develop. And I think from an industry standpoint, that has got, that has to be, that's gotta be the bar of, of just creating these environments, culture and a livable wage where people uh, want to be in this industry and they're not looking well, I can make more money this summer mowing lawns or, you know, swinging a hammer than I can, you know, being yelled at in a kitchen for, you know, 12 hours a day. So I just think that, you know, that is going to be an industry challenge that all levels of restaurants are going to have to face over the, in the coming years to really maintain a solid population of, of employees. Awesome. Great. Thank you, Jeremy. Ben, what's your thoughts? Um, I think like if anything, this last year has showed us is just when it comes to just community outreach and community support, restaurants stepped up really, really hard. And when we had nothing to give, we were willing to give, you know, the food that we had that we haven't cooked yet. And just I think that's an important thing that shouldn't go away. You know, I know like when we you know, we were producing meals every week for the Amos house, which is a soup kitchen here. Um, but they also are a training facility for, you know, at risk youth to be able to like learn how to cook and get into this whole system. And I think like the spotlight shown on giving these donations and giving the, this support is something that really came to the forefront for a lot of restaurants. And I know a lot of restaurants that were doing it, that are doing it more than ever than they have before. And I hope that that is one of these, you know, these, sort of like blank slate items that stays and that becomes part of what we are as a restaurant community, um, specifically where you are and seeing the needs of your community. And, you know, it's not necessarily to make, the you know, it's the greater good, but, you know, each area is different. I think that's going to be one thing that, like, I know that we have part of our weekly meetings are just outreach and how do we go to those around us and how can we help our community and lift our community more? And that just becomes part of it. And I hope that's something that gets instilled in, a, in, in every facet of the restaurant industry as well, because of that, that just breeds a kindness and a self-awareness and a ability to look past, you know, everything that goes on in a restaurant. You, there's, there's a way to reshift priorities with it. Oh, that's great, Ben. That really is. Thank you so much. And Mariana, your closing thoughts? So I really do think that this year, even with all the challenges and everything, it has brought a lot of good things as well. And, you know, a lot of reinventing, um, a lot of just really looking at everyone else different and really appreciating the team around you more than ever. Um, like Jeremy said, I think it's going to be super important to just like, you know, treat people right and give them that work-life balance that the industry hasn't always had, because that's just what is going to keep people in the industry. And it's going to keep people working hard, um, towards the goals of the team. But I think it's also, you know, the upcoming years, it's just going to be a time to, really look at every little detail of what we do in our kitchens and just seeing what we could do better. And if that is, you know, giving people like a little bit more money or, you know, making sure that like 
uh, Ben said, we're doing outreach to the communities, you know, thanking the community for supporting us through this whole time. I just think it's just going to be really important to, like I said, just look at everything that's going on in the industry and seeing how we can reinvent little parts of it and how we can just become more of that human side that the industry sometimes loses. And, you know, at the end of the day, we are the service industry. We are here because we love to make people smile with our food. We love people like sharing those holidays with us and joining around the food of table. And I think it's going to be super important to just focusing on those core values of why we started cooking rather than, you know, some things that might have gotten muddled um, through the through time in in the industry. That's great. Thank you very much. And for all of you that uh, our members and sponsors are out there, thank you for being with us today. Uh, a couple of quick notes. Just wanted to let you know that, of course, this is the first webinar in our new series, and we've got a lot of them coming up. Uh, the next one is uh, is on the fifth of May, so Cinco de Mayo. So. We decided we're actually going to feature Mexican cheese and tequila might play a role in there somewhere. Um, but that, that'll be fun. And then the two weeks after that, we have Simon Majumdar uh, and Justin Warner coming on to talk about behind the scenes of what happened in tournament champions, but also talk about food and trends and what their philosophy is and where they see things going as well. So uh, again, thanks to all of you for being a part of this and being a part of our upcoming ICCA summit. Um, in June, uh, that's going to be based out of Providence, but also we're going to come to uh, Boston and Newport as well in our culinary road trips. And that information is on our website for everybody in ICCA and for GCIA uh, going to, um, to uh, Portland, Maine next week. So you'll have more information coming to you after that for our event coming up in October. But thanks to everyone. We really appreciate it. We'll close out with our video that Mike will show. And uh, again, thanks. We'll see you in two weeks. And uh, thanks again for being with us. Thanks, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye.